that you may be. I am so elated and excited that you continue to watch all together. We here at Second Punts are thankful for your viewership. And we're gonna kick off a brand new series today. This whole month, we are going to talk about God, but we're going to prescribe a characteristic to God that is often overlooked. And the title of this series is The Detailed Oriented God. We're gonna talk about why details matter. And we're gonna talk about how we, as believers in Christ, or even those who are curious about the faith, can actually walk with God following these details and be made better. So today, travel with me to Genesis chapter six, verses 14 through 22. Consider with me this thought as you go to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, this thought that following God's details saved me. Friends, as we have to understand is this, that details are important simply because details matter to God. I want us to explore and reflect on the detail-oriented God because I think many of us have heard that God is sovereign. We know God to be powerful Many of us also know God to be a provider, but God is detailed oriented. We don't serve a God that just glosses over the details. We serve a God who is in the details. See, God was detailed all throughout the Bible and even in our lives. Just think about it for a moment. God was detailed oriented in the order and the specific way that he created heaven, but also earth. God was detailed oriented all the way by giving us the Ten Commandments, which speak to how we are to have a relationship with God, but also how we're supposed to have a relationship with each other. God is detailed oriented in the way that he knew we had a sin problem. He knew we were toe up from the flow up and said, you know what? I won't trust them to actually do it, but in turn, I'm going to send Jesus to die for the sins of humanity. And his message, his life, his interactions, and his sentiments literally fulfilled the law and scripture and even established a brand new covenant for all of us. Friends, I gotta tell you today that God is strong. God is mighty. God is amazing. God is sovereign. But God is also very much detailed-oriented. What do we find God being detailed oriented. Well, we got to start in Genesis. You see, the book of Genesis details our creation. It details how the world was made. It details even our fallenness. It details everything we need. But one thing I love about Genesis is that it holds a mirror up to all of creation and we get to see exactly who 
and what we are. It's in this book that we notice how God loves us and we can vividly notice the detailed oriented God in action. See, this book of Genesis was written around 1450 to 1410 B.C. And it has key people in it. You may have heard some of these people. We got Adam, of course. We got our girl Eve. <laughs> we have Noah. We have Abraham. We have Sarah. We have so many more that are just familiar people. So when you get some time, read the book of Genesis. You'll like it. <laughs> But today we focus in Genesis chapter 6, verses 14 through 22, where we're going to notice the wickedness of the world, the pain this causes, the anger of God that leads to the detailed plan to save a remnant of people. Notice with me in verse 14, very simply, the plan. See, you have to always remember that God's in the details. God cares about the details and God communicates to us many, many, many details that we often overlook. Mm -hmm. Listen to the plan in verse 14 of chapter 6 of Genesis. It says to make for yourself, this is God talking to Noah, an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. This one verse is filled to the brim with details. God desires for Noah to one, make an ark. Mm -hmm. That's a detail. A second detail is that God tells Noah, I want you to make an ark of gopher wood, not oak wood, <laughs> not any other type of wood, gopher wood. The third detail here is he says, I need you to make an ark with compartments. <laughs> God is already thinking about, he got a plan of how this thing should come about. But then the fourth detail, he says, I need you to cover the outside and inside of this ark with pitch. If you're like me, you're like, what in the world is pitch? Well, pitch is a tar-like substance that's used to make the ark and the ark so tightly closed that it's water tight. Friends, God is detailing for Noah exactly the plan, the generalized plan, if you will, for an ark to be built. This ark is going to sustain Noah and his family. God wants this ark to be built strong with compartments to be able to be tightly fastened together so that the turbulence that happens on the outside can never affect what's on the inside. But what's so beautiful about this generalized plan is that this generalized plan for us is specific to the future that God is going to allow to happen. See, God knows what's coming. So he's really setting Noah up, if you will. He's saying, I'm setting you up for success, my brother. If you just follow these instructions, everything is going to be well and you will remain safe. Can I tell you a little secret? Details as such aren't just given to Noah, but details as such are also given to us. See, this is why God allows us to experience good situations and bad circumstances. Why? Because he's growing our faith at the same time of our discomfort. This is why God sends encouragement through people, through songs, through text messages, and even those associates that we really don't know too well. Why? Because he is allowing a kind word to increase our endurance. This is why our great moments, along with our embarrassing moments, coupled with our frustrating moments, remain in the pot of life's gumbo, and they all work together for our good. Why? Because God sees what's going to happen. God, he understands that Noah doesn't catch it right now, but something magnanimous is about to occur and God has a plan for it all. Friends, I want you to catch this, that God is so detailed that he knows the faith we will need in the times we will need it. God is so detailed that God knows the strength we're going to need before the obstacle is ever presented. God is so detailed that he's preparing us today for the maybe the problem 
problems of tomorrow while increasing our faith all at the same time. I know it doesn't feel like it. We love to experience pain and believe it has no purpose. We become frustrated and have no clue that God is building our faith all at the same time. But in God's details, we must never miss this point that he's also mysterious in some ways. My grandmother used to say it this way, God works in mysterious ways, in mysterious ways to carry out his purpose for our lives. Friends, Noah is noticing the details of God, but he's also unnoticing the mysterious ways that God is helping, forming, shaping, and going to keep his family safe in the future. Friends, we see the generalized plan, but notice with me in verses 15 through 16, the specific details of this plan. The text says, this is how you shall make the ark. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and put the door of the ark on the side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Friends, I want y'all to know something. I, as a child, disliked math. It was nothing real good or cute about math class for Josh Scott right here. But also, when I first read this text, I was about six or seven years old. And you go to talking about cubits, 30 cubits, 300 cubits, and it made me mad because I loved church at the time. <laughs> and I said, now you want to bring math into this thing, God? I got a problem, man. Well, friends, I got to let you know, it's good to do a little math right now because we are going to take the ancient system of mathematics and, and feet and length, and we're going to translate it over to something we can understand, friends. 300 cubits translates actually to be 510 feet long. That means the ark that God wanted Noah to be responsible for building, to keep him safe, to keep his family safe, was no small building project. 510 feet long, he was supposed to build this thing out of gopher wood. But yet, he tells us that 50 cubits it translates over to be 75 feet wide. Y'all, that is bigger and wider than most places and things that we know. But yet it also tells us 30 cubits well, is what the text mentions. Well, 30 cubits actually translates to be 45 feet tall. Listen, y'all, that's taller than Shaq and Yao Ming put together. And so he was supposed to build an ark of 510 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. This behemoth structure was not meant to just be big, y'all, <laughs> but it was meant to be specifically gigantic with details on purpose. <laughs> Don't miss that, y'all. <laughs> Do not believe, however, that God gave Noah this great building project simply because he wanted Noah to just have something to pass the time by. No, <laughs> God detailed in specificity how this ark was to be built. Again, I tell you, because what's blurry to us is clear to God. <laughs> what we don't understand, God does understand. There's a huge lesson here. I want you to catch this because when God reveals specific details to you, learn to not overlook them. When God starts telling you the nooks and crannies of the steps that you must take, learn to not just say, oh, I'll get to it later. <laughs> you need to do it now because God reveals details for our safety, but also for our betterment. <laughs> Friends, we must learn to follow God's details even when they're 510 feet long. <laughs> we have to learn how to follow God's details even when they're taller than Shaq and Yao Ming put together. We got to learn how to follow God's details even when it's abnormal to us. It reveals the Almighty to us. And, God, and I want you to see through Noah's life this generalized plan that becomes specific. And Noah has to probably be like, God, this is a lot. Mm. 
But what I love about God in all the ways he's so detailed oriented is that he knows our thoughts before we think them. And so Noah probably is thinking that this building plan is so big that he may not be able to carry it out. Well, then God tells him the reason for this plan in verses 17 through 18. Listen to the text. The text says, now behold, I myself am bringing the flood of water upon the earth. That's the reason to destroy all flesh in which there is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Y'all stay with me, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark. You, your sons, your wife and your sons, wives with you. Y'all. Verses 17 and 18 is where it gets real. See, the reason for this 510 foot long arc to be built is because God is about to send a massive flood to the earth. However, Noah and Noah's sons and his family and a, a lot of animals are going to be inside. And if they follow the details correctly, they'll be safe. The reason's clear, a flood is coming. But why the flood? Hmm. Within these verses, it smacks us in the face that we notice here the wrath of God. Hmm. For many of you all, I know you just heard wrath, you heard God, you're like, uh oh, <laughs> please stay with me, don't log off yet. Because there are different views on this passage right here of Scripture in Genesis 6. However, what is agreeable to note is that among the Sumerians, the people from the ancient Near East, even those from Mesopotamia, along with those who believe in the validity of the Bible and Jesus, everybody comes to agree on the fact that a great flood did occur and come to the earth. The Bible addresses the reason for the flood, revealing that God was displeased with the overwhelming wickedness that creation was committing. The overwhelming wickedness that creation was committing. The course of action here that God chose to take was a flood coming to wipe the earth. Mm. Friends, I know when I read this, I feel tension. When I communicated to you, I feel tension. Because I want to ask God, why would you allow a flood to come and kill all of these people? What were you thinking? But then as I read verse 17, I got tension. But in verse 18, I hear him say, I'm establishing my covenant with you, Noah. Hmm. Friends, I know that maybe you're like me in verse 17 where you hear this and conclude that God is mean. God may be heartless to you. God could be angry to you. I will say God is angry. We see it. But to prescribe that God is heartless or mean, no, we can't really think that because that's not true. See, God does, in fact, however, have a standard of holiness, a standard that he wants us to meet in how we live. God details this standard throughout the Bible. He communicated it even as Jesus came to earth and how Jesus ate with sinners, how Jesus was not judgmental, how Jesus continued to love others. That's the ethic of love that God wants us to model. However, at this time, there's cruelty happening. There's wickedness happening. There's hatred happening. And God is not pleased. Friends, can I tell you that God wants us to model the standard that he has set forth and to live out the ethic of love. And just as many of us would claim that we have levels, <laughs> that we are multifaceted, here's the truth, so is God. So does God get angry with us? So does God, is he happy with us? So is God blessed in this way and great in other ways? This text shows us that God is not one or the other. God is both and, not either or. Mm. This text shows us that God is love, but God also holds us accountable. This text shows us that God is patient, yes, 
but God desires that we follow God. This text shows us that, yes, God is a hope dealer, but God desires for us to hear, live, and do the word. So what does God do? In verse 17, he tells the reason a flood is coming. But yet in verse 18, we're told that God establishes his covenant with Noah and his family. Oh, friends, you got to check this. <laughs> if God is so unloving, if you just rest in the tension, if you just say God is heartless, God is mean, God ain't right. If you rest in that tension, then tell me why would God go from this to that, establishing his covenant with Noah? Why would he ever have a contingency plan that would save a remnant and animals if he was so heartless and mean? <laughs> Friends, you have to understand a covenant is actually a formal agreement between God and creation. And he establishes this covenant with Noah saying, after this flood, I'll never use the waters to come and take out all of humanity again. Friends, I, I, I see hope in the scripture. I see tension in verse 17. I see hope in verse 18 because if the, if the covenant is established with Noah, that means we're beneficiaries of this same agreement. I like the way Russell Nelson describes what a covenant is. He says, a covenant made with God should be regarded not as restrictive, but as protective. See, God has boundaries for us, y'all. We're not limitless, God is. God has a standard for us. It's not to restrict us, but it's to protect us. Now, although speaking of the flood shows us the why for the ark to be built. Yes, it reveals the wrath of God, but we also see the covenant of God. <laughs> we also see the unconditional love of God. We also see the patience of God. We also see the great, great love that God goes through hurdles. He jumps over mountains. Why? Because he loves all of us. Mm -hmm. Due to the covenant that God established with Noah, everybody was safe inside that ark. Friends, as I think about details, I think about my cooking expertise, if you will. Mm -hmm. I would never in a million years classify that I am a great cook. But one thing I can do is I can follow instructions. <laughs> That's why I love cookbooks made by the right people. Because some people's cookbooks leave out details that are important. But some people's cookbooks can, you follow that stuff, <laughs> those instructions, and it's just like your mother cooked it. Friends, I love cookbooks because it details for me every step as to how to make a great dish, macaroni and cheese, even fried chicken. And I can follow these instructions and steps and my wife and my family will believe that I am the world's cook, at least for a moment. But you know, there are some times where I like to take a little liberty. And sometimes I say, well, you know what? I won't add this. Instead, I'll add this. I'll put paprika instead of maybe some salt. And when I live on the edge, instead of following the instructions, my dish is in jeopardy. It could either turn out great for me or it could either turn out horribly for me. Can I tell you something? <laughs> That's how life is when God gives us details. We can choose to follow them and take a chance and maybe grace will be found there, we'll be okay. Or we may take this chance and it could lead to our demise. My brothers and sisters, God has detailed for us how we are to live, what we should believe in, what life should actually be for us. And guess what? When the trials of life come above our head, he's even told us who we are to hope in. Question is, Will you be like Noah and follow the details? Mm -hmm. Following the details actually saved Noah and his family. But we have to learn to follow those details as well. And so what I want you to do this week, I'm challenging you. I want you to take that cookbook perspective and Noah's narrative, combine it and apply it to your life. And I want you to willingly Ask God for some details. 
It could be a relationship that's struggling right now. You need to know how to deal with it. It could be a boss that you and that boss are having some friction and you need to know how to deal with it. Whatever it is, whatever problem, even whatever great thing, ask God for the details as to how to deal with it. Because following details saved Noah and following details helps and saves us. Let's pray. God, you're in the details. Help us to follow the details. In your name we do pray. Amen. Come out of hiding, you're safe here with me. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold your peace. You've been on lockdown and I'll hold the key. Cause I loved you before, you knew it was a love, and I saw Still I chose the cross And you were the one That I was thinking of When I rose from the grave Now rid of the shackles My victory's yours I tore the veil For you to come close There's no reason to stand At a distance anymore You're not far when you're lost at sea I will illuminate everything No need to be frightened by intimacy No, just throw off your fear and come running to me
friends, our together takeaway today is pretty simple. God is in the details, so follow God. It's simple. Right now, friends, there may be somebody right here watching and you feel like God has detailed for you throughout maybe years or even some days or even right now that he wants to have a relationship with you. Y'all, that's why Jesus died because he wants to put, wanted always to put us in a relationship with God. And so friends, if you don't know Christ, but you wanna know Christ, you can do so from right where you are. Let's pray. If you repeat this prayer, it jumpstarts your relationship today. Let's pray together. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of God's love. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I confess that Christ is the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you have just prayed that prayer, I want you to email today, altogether at spdl.org. If you have any prayer requests or any feedback for us, we want to hear from you. Hey, email us at altogether at spdl.org. Friends, as we prepare to leave this virtual space, I want you to know God is a God of details. We need to follow them. And if by chance you want to sow into this ministry, you can do so by going online to our website at spdl.org and clicking that given option. This week, Remember that cookbook perspective. Follow the details, the dish comes out well. We follow God's details, our life can be well. Have a great week, do some following of God, and remember, God knows what we do not, so follow God. Have a great week.